You make tough calls when caring for acutely ill and injured children. Join us for strategy and support through clinical cases, research, and reviews, and best practice guidance in our ever-changing acute care landscape. This is your Pediatric Emergency Playbook. Welcome to the Playbook. I'm your host and coach, Tim Horechko. Today we have a focused episode on a tough subject, gunshot wounds in children. It's difficult because we think of this as an adult issue, but it's important to be ready to deal with because trauma is the leading cause of death in children ages 1 to 18, and penetrating injury accounts for up to 20% of all pediatric trauma. Firearms are the majority cause of penetrating trauma. This isn't the scenario of the hardened adult who has a history of GSWs that he somehow survives each time. In children, this is always a devastating event. The mortality for GSWs is much higher in children. It's a matter of real estate. The bullet is the same size, but does much more damage locally because of the smaller surface area in children. Today, we'll go through a bit of of a ballistics tutorial to reorient ourselves to what's happening at the time of impact, what that translates to physiologically in the child, and how we can give the gunshot victim the best chance we can. Let's focus. Lethality in GSWs has a lot to do with physics. We'll just talk about the clinically relevant aspects today. Projectile dispersion, impulse, yaw, deformation, and fragmentation. Dispersion seems obvious. It's a matter of a spread of tiny spheres like birdshot or larger ones like buckshot, or maybe it's just one large caliber bullet. Impulse is how much the momentum changes as a result of a force acting on it over a period of time. So, I don't know, you may fist bump someone gently, or you could punch a wall. Those two scenarios have very different momentum changes or impulses. Yaw, Y-A-W, it's an interesting feature that sometimes gets forgotten. Yaw is the rotation of the bullet tip as it travels through the tissues. I call it the bullet tumble. Deformation is how much the tissues deform while the bullet travels through them. And fragmentation is how the bullet pieces break apart in the body. As you can see, this is never a clean surgical wound. It's a bloody, pulpy mess. Bullets come in all kinds of specifications, pointed tips, round, hollow, full metal jackets, partial, even scored. The most important category for us is whether the bullet is an expanding type or not. Expanding bullets are designed to maximize tissue damage. Non-expanding bullets have a pointed tip and are designed to travel further in the tissues. They maintain their shape. I mention this detail because you may get some prelim info from the police who arrive to the ED or some collateral information you get from EMS. They can be a rich source of information. Even their best guess may help to understand what this child is in danger of developing as a result of his gunshot wound. What you see is often not what you get. Speaking of which, bullets lacerate or crush supporting tissues and bone. But when a bullet enters a fluid-filled organ, like the heart or the lungs or bowel, that impulse introduces an abrupt pressure change that can burst that organ immediately. The bullet can yaw and tumble further and fragment. Much of this damage we'll see on CTs or possibly eventually on laparoscopy. It's the next feature of gunshot wounds that makes them tricky killers. Cavitation is the disruption of the tissues caused by the bullet. It can be temporary or permanent. When we see that little fingertip-sized bullet hole in the flank, it may not look that impressive. This is only what we see, only the permanent cavitation that was formed. If you think about it, if you have a 120-kilogram adult, the bullet itself is relatively small to the person's body mass and organs. But even in an adult, the temporary cavitation 
is what causes the maximum damage. Think of a big old block of jello. You just poke it with your finger and the whole thing jiggle wiggles. Ballistic gelatin is a firm type of gelatin used for forensics or even to mock up an ultrasound guided IV demo. Anyway, the texture and resistance is similar to the average of body tissues. Uh, imagine the bullet careening through the tissues, leaving an expanded wake of energy that is up to 30 times the size of the bullet. That temporary cavitation immediately collapses back into place after the energy wave is over, but imagine the disruption to local tissues. The organs may look like they're back into place, but the temporary cavitation just caused an ischemic penumbra that puts all of the surrounding tissues and organs at risk. More formally, you have a primary wound track, the contusion zone, and the concussion zone. The primary wound track is the permanent cavity with dead crushed tissue. The contusion zone surrounds this with inflammatory cellular debris. Surrounding that is the concussion zone with unseen tissue damage from stretching, shearing, and compression. Okay, that's enough ballistics for now. What are the injuries that we see or don't realize we're seeing, and how can we do damage control and resuscitation? Let's separate the injuries from head to toe. Gunshot wounds to the head in anyone are terrible. The mortality in children is even higher. It's three times that of an adult. If you have a child with a declining mental status after a GSW to the head, this is almost always fatal. The variables associated with mortality include a GCS of under eight, unilateral dilated pupil, and of course, by hemispheric trajectory. The St. Louis scale for pediatric gunshot wounds to the head generates a score based on all of these features. Now, of course, we don't use this in the ED, but I just mention it in case the discussion with the neurosurgeon takes that course. What we're focused in in the ED is to stabilize and to optimize. Some things just become clearer with time. So what can we focus on in the here and now? We can address or prevent the three villains in head trauma, hypoxia, hypoperfusion, and acidosis. Isolated, penetrating neck injuries in children are uncommon from an epidemiologic standpoint, but also from an anatomic standpoint. They have a large head and a short neck. If you see a child with a penetrating neck wound, a gun, knife, metal rod from a fence, anything, just know that the real estate issue comes back up again. More damage is done because of the concentration of structures in a small space. It's relatively uncommon to have to intubate an adult with penetrating trauma into the neck unless we see hard signs like an expanding hematoma or altered mental status or there's rarely a transection of the airway, but it happens. In children, even if that tiny little bullet hole looks so puny, we know that 25% of them will need intubation. Just think of it this way. In medical patients who need intubation, we get all upset about a, a second pass of the laryngoscope because of the edema it can cause for a good reason. Just think of all that edema caused by temporary cavitation now. Be conservative and be proactive. Gunshot wounds to the thorax kill. They come in second only to GSWs to the head. Epidemiologically, you'll see this, unfortunately, mostly in adolescent males. Anything is on the table here. Hemothorax, pneumothorax, cardiac tamponade. If the patient loses pulses in front of you, this is the best indication for an emergent thoracotomy. We talked in detail about how to do this in the episode Multisystem Trauma in Children, Part 1. If the penetrating object is somehow removed by the victim or the bystander pre-hospitally, it's usually fatal, and when they come to see you, it's just too late. Each hemithorax can hold up to half of the patient's circulating blood volume. This is another way that children are vulnerable in trauma. Their thorax is pliable and elastic and will keep accommodating that blood. Tamponading it off is not really something that happens. It may not be obvious to you initially because children, as we know, can compensate for blood loss 
pretty well with their tachycardia. They can compensate up to a blood loss of 40% of their circulating volume. Not only is the circulatory system worse than it may seem, but they're also easily affected from a pulmonary standpoint. They have smaller functional residual capacity, higher oxygen consumption, and of course, they don't tolerate hypoxia well. Add that all together, the hemoglobin boxcars are less, the circulating volume is less, the oxygenating machinery is impaired. Any one of those things separately may lead to an arrest. The relatively hemodynamically stable child or adolescent may just come in with dyspnea or anxiety or tachycardia or pleural pain. But remember, you're going to be extra proactive about looking for asymmetry in chest rise, a hard thing to do in children. You're going to listen carefully for decreased breath sounds. You're going to put that ultrasound probe on to look for lung sliding even before you get that chest x-ray. Be ready to resuscitate and be ready to put that chest tube in. Injuries to the abdomen and pelvis are really a crapshoot. The bullet may have traveled anywhere. It may have ricocheted from anywhere, causing all kinds of local and regional damage. The point here is that in the head, the neck, the thorax, they may compensate quickly, but you kind of know where to look. In the abdomen and pelvis, you do have some time to figure it out, but you do have to go looking, sometimes in places you hadn't expected. The worst thing is to see a gunshot wound in the abdomen, but no bullet on plane film in the room because that bullet made its way into the vena cava and traveled cephalad. Crazy. Patients will present with pain, tenderness, free air, or hemorrhage. Most surgeons will be receptive for this, but you as the frontline clinician for children may need to help prompt your colleagues who may just not see this very much. In children, blunt abdominal injury is the more common pattern and it's more commonly treated conservatively because after an auto versus a pedestrian or some blunt injury to the belly, even high grade liver lax will be contained by Gleason's capsule, that fascia surrounding the liver. Most of these blunt abdominal trauma victims are admitted to the PICU, they're watched, they're given blood products as necessary. This, of course, is not true in penetrating trauma. And you may be speaking with a surgeon who is not familiar with children or may want to pass this off to somebody else, transfer or delay, all with good intentions, of course. But this is your chance to help reorient them and refocus on the fact that the mortality in children in penetrating trauma is higher than adults, regardless of what, body, what area of the body is affected. Colton et al. reported the frequency of intra-abdominal organ injury in penetrating trauma in children. 70% were in a hollow viscous, with the small and large bowels being the major contributors. Liver injuries occurred in 27% and major vessels 19%. It's a scary black box and we've all been warned. Penetrating injuries to the extremities are pretty straightforward. Stop the bleed with direct compression or if you need to with a temporary tourniquet, Look for arterial, bony, and nerve injuries, and watch for compartment syndrome. Increasing opioid requirements, pain out of proportion to what you would expect, this is the most specific sign of impending compartment syndrome. Spinal injuries are a little trickier. The direct path of the bullet, of course, can cause core damage, but the concussive effect of the missile may cause ischemia or enough edema to develop permanent spinal cord injury. Even if the patient arrives neurologically intact, if the GSW to the spine fractures the pedicles or the facets, the spine itself may be unstable. And that later, because you've moved the patient or because the patient uh, rolled over or was transferred over the scanner, that can cause secondary spinal cord injury. The good news here is that children do have an advantage. They are the best rehabilitation candidates when it comes to spinal cord injury, and they may regain some function. Any chance of spinal injury? Make sure you have complete spinal precautions while you evaluate further. The mainstay of this is analgesia, but you may have to progress to sedation or intubation to protect the patient from himself.
That's a lot to process even in a focus on episode. So let's summarize. It's all about real estate. In smaller bodies, the same bullet can cause much more damage by permanent cavitation or the temporary cavitation caused by the energy wave through the tissues. What you see is often not what you get yet. Be assertive and proactive with investigation. If you think about doing the exam, do it. They can compensate very well until they fall off the cliff. Penetrating head trauma is grim. Do what you can to battle the three villains of hypoxia, hypovolemia, and acidosis. Penetrating neck injuries, 25% will need intubation. Optimize them early. Penetrating thoracic injuries, you can hold quite the blood volume in a hemithorax. Tachycardia is the body's way of screaming, I need you to stop that bleed. Penetrating abdominal injuries, find the bullet, find the bleed. Penetrating spine injuries, it's not just about the primary injury. Instability of the spine causes secondary injury. We sometimes get a little complacent with adults with penetrating injury because sadly it's not uncommon. They often do well because of what we do well. This is a case where children truly are more vulnerable because of the injury itself and because we may not appreciate the extent of their injuries. Be ready and be proactive. Thank you for listening. Until next time, remember, you are the champion for the child in front of you. Take care. Thank you for listening to The Playbook. We welcome your comments, questions, and feedback. Email Tim at coach at PEMplaybook.org or drop by our website for show notes and more strategy at PEMplaybook.org. See you there.